fostering innovation and improving the lives of our kids. As we outline the key strategies and goals of AI and analytics and excellence today, your insights and contributions will be crucial. Let's work together to shape a smarter, more responsive government and a community leadership and governance. That's it. Hey, Robert, hold on. Let me, let me get the PowerPoint up. And th this is roll call, so we should be good for that. Everyone should have an agenda at their table. It's the only slide we have now. But, uh, because we have some new members, I think it would be helpful to go around uh, the, the table and just kind of move in this direction. And just uh, say your um, your name, the organization you're representing, and your role. Starting. Uh, my name is Cecil Davis. I represent the Arkansas Judiciary. I'm the deputy CIO for the AOC. Hi, I'm Alex Johnson with the Department of Agriculture. Alan Fitzgerald, CIO, Department of Public Safety. Kendall Pendleton, Veterans Affairs. Brian Melton, Department of Military, CIO. Guy Triarnachalam, Department of Labor and Licensing. Charlie Collins, I'm the Revenue Commissioner with DFNA. Gary Vance, Chief Security Officer with DIS. Uh, Jay Harden, uh, Interim Director of DIS and representing TSS. Robert McGee, Chief Data Officer. Dr. Ford, uh, Office of the Arts Attorney General, Senior Assistant Director. I'm Wade Hodge, I'm Chief of Staff of the Department of Corrections. Uh, Mitch Rouse, I'm Chief of Staff at the Department of Human Services. Jim Carter, with the Chief Information Officer with the Department of Health. Matt Stratan, I'm Director of Geospatial Services at Data Scouts, and we are a private sector designee of the President Pro Tem. Brian Rogers, I'm representing the Department of Commerce. I'm Deputy Director in the new Policy and Innovation section of Department of Workforce Services. This is Sarkar, I'm the Chief Information Officer for the Department of Education. And we also have some guests today that we'll announce in a little bit. Um, we have one housekeeping uh, order to, to take care of, uh, and that is election of a, a vice chair for the Data Transparency Panel for Act 912 of 2016. The DPP uh, shall select the vice chair of the panel uh, on an annual basis. Uh, at the, the last meeting, I asked for nominations. We received a nomination from the Attorney General's office for. Thank you. Set aside about an hour today to talk about the, the Arkansas workforce strategy. This is it, it, it involves just about every department and aspect of our state. Um, in Executive Order 2316, um, Governor Sanders set it forth that it should be a daily driven workforce strategy. So I think many elements of the workforce strategy you know, are, are relevant to the day of the panel. And we really wanted, um, as we're starting to move into implementation of some of the key strategic initiatives on the first strategy, to, uh, to make sure that everybody has awareness, everyone is briefed, and we can look at that, uh, say, say the government's mechanism from you know, uh, the standpoint of data quality, security, privacy, trust, and ultimately effective use of data to support our state's workforce efforts. Uh, we're going to go through the full history of the development. Um, Executive Order 2316 established the Arkansas Governor's Workforce Cabinet, which is uh, comprised, uh, it's chaired by Chief Workforce Officer Mike Rogers, uh, and the members are the Secretaries of the Departments of Commerce, Education, Public Safety, Veterans Affairs, Human Services, Labor and Licensing, uh, and Transportation and Insurance Services, um, throughout the year that uh, many, many groups engage, lots of employer providers, other state personnel to, to really try to leverage the collective wisdom of our state at identifying challenges, barriers, needs, opportunities, 
uh, and potential strategies we might, we might take just to support and advance our state's uh, workforce development. Um, you go to the next slide, Nancy. There, uh, there's a document on the governor's work website. We didn't want to print, completely print the whole thing out, uh, but the, it's a PDF, it's about 20 pages that has the Arkansas workforce strategy, um, even if that it is fairly condensed. Um, so you know, if any member of the government would I mean, we'll be happy to go into more details. Uh, myself and my team would be happy to talk about more of the, the data specific pieces and, and anything of relevance to the EPP around security, privacy, governance, uh, use. Um, th I think this picture does a pretty good job of just sort of summary, summing up the key heart and vision of what the government workforce is out there. Uh, really put together with collective input from across the state, uh, and it's it's really kind of moving um, from pro program centric service delivery to customer centric service delivery, um, leading to the digital transformation for the experience we expect in our daily lives from consumer technologies uh, to make it uh, easy using data and, and technology to make residents. Um, a streamlined approach to finding and applying for services, finding and employment careers, jobs, other opportunities to register apprenticeships, you know, lots of learning and work things, and um, find training and education, which also has a component there, you know, helping education and training providers to have uh, meaningful data on the evolving employer, um, and helping employers themselves to build a find and retain talent. To better understand our talent pipelines, to better more readily communicate with through data and with semantic consistency, their evolving needs, um, and this includes consideration for economic development. You know, the, the employers that we wish to have in the future or want to. You know, see the the next slide, Matthew. Uh, so that. There is about a, there's a page uh, on each of these strategic initiatives in the workforce strategy. I think we could write a book on each one of these. Uh, we can uh, later on in the agenda we'll talk about the future the <coughs> settings. And I think uh, over the, the next quarterly meetings we can dive a little bit deeper into different pieces. But uh, if there's any interest in these, these are designed. You know, with the collective wisdom of the state for everybody to use. So please indicate interest in um, and end into this segment. And after you see one of these live, we, we can have some open discussion and address any kind of questions, particularly around the, the, the aspects of interest to the DPP. Um, the first one, which is a little bit more of a methodology, but it's a very data uh, driven and informed methodology as our tools is talent pipeline management. That's a, that's a mechanism for employers to. Um, more efficiently signal demand, signal occupation needs, signal skill needs, which are, are important for aligning our education and workforce pipelines. Um, the next one, uh, credential transparency. This is the new uh, Arkansas Credential Registry, which uh, is, is already up, it's already available. Um, there are already thousands of credentials published um, from the Arkansas Credential School District, from the Arkansas Division of Higher Education, even Goodwill Industries. Uh, that is linked open data on credentials. It's, it's transparency, it's uh, human or machine readable, and it's, it's a knowledge graph that can continue to grow and facilitate shared stewardship on who are our providers, what are the credentials, what are the learning opportunities, and what are the skills represented by those credentials, uh, what are job roles and the skills with those, um, and any supportive services, financial assistance, or anything related to that ecosystem. So, I think this will continue to grow a lot over the next several years, and it'll just get better and better as you know, we have more publishing and more open, transparent access for consumers and for our own programs to this. Um, a piece related to that is uh, learning and employment records or digital credentials. For that, we've, uh, we're uh, getting started with the Arkansas Digital Credential Ecosystem. This is a way um, to take administrative records or learning and employment records, maybe from an institution, from a provider, and equip an Arkansan with those records that they have that digital uh, verification of their credentials and can use it for a variety of reasons. 
Because that's uh, really a different tier of governance where we're empowering the, the resident with their, their records for the you know, consent based full sovereign access and use of the records that pertain to them. Um, a lot of those are empowering what we're going to see a lot more of uh, next, which is the in the workforce strategy. It's called the skills based learning employment and advancement platform. This is this, the center of a lot of discussion, and this is where the rubber meets the road in terms of access for residents, employers, and eventually students, providers, and more. Um, we'll see more of that from some of our partners in just a few minutes. Um, integrated service delivery. Uh, we saw CiviForm at the last meeting. That's sort of a statewide platform for common discovery and uh, application to government and community services. Um, the full integrated service delivery pipeline is a number of stages from uh, sharing information and speaking consistently on intake to programs, on assessment of needs and barriers, on uh, success, development, training plans, on referrals and co-enrollment strategies, on shared case management, on credential attainment, on common exit, and ultimately on measuring and communicating outcomes so that we kind of get a virtuous cycle of um, continuous improvement using data and evaluation and research. Uh, the uh, jobs and employment data exchange is a way to transform the way employers report um, administrative uh, labor market information, a, a huge variety of state and federal reporting requirements in a way that reduces employer reporting burden while increasing uh, the timeliness, the quality, the comprehensiveness of the data available to, to us as state officials to serve citizens. Um, the workforce data infrastructure, uh, all of this requires infrastructure. So that's really looking at how, uh, what we specifically need within the Arkansas Data Hub, which will probably be a, be a topic for the, the next meeting to kind of give an update on that to support all of these efforts. Um, the Workforce System Digital Twin and Analysis uh, is a, a, a key initiative of Chief Rogers, who uh, worked in, uh, at, at Tyson and was very used to having a digital twin of, of all of the operations and be able to simulation, optimization, ask questions, always know what's going on. So if you like to you know, work towards some, having some of a digital twin of our, our talent pipelines over our economy so that we can all be better informed in our decision making. Um, and finally, this is an initiative, but it's sort of at the end, how do we measure, evaluate, and continuously improve the implementation of these strategies? And so that would be data-driven performance management and, and key performance indicators. Uh, that can be looking at um, outputs and outcomes, the use of the statewide longitudinal data system, um, or whatever measurements uh, and analyses that the Governor's Workforce Cabinet finds useful. That's that's kind of a high level laundry list, and we would be happy to to go in more detail on any of that offline, or if you want to service that as a meeting for a, a future topic. But we wanted to get time to actually uh, let our some of our partners show the skills based learning and employment advancement platform, which Governor Sanders has named Arkansas Launch. Um, so I'm going to turn over to the screen to partners from Research Improving People's Lives. They're a tech for social impact nonprofit um, who have been working with us on this to uh, generous philanthropic funding from the Walmart Foundation. Um, so Judd and Taka, uh, over to you to talk a little bit about launch. Thanks so much, Robert, and everyone, we really appreciate your time today. Uh, my name is Mintaka Angel. I'm the CEO of Ripple Research Improving People's Lives. We are a tech for social impact nonprofit that works with states across the country to help um, policy leaders use data science and technology to best meet the needs of their constituents. And it's been a huge honor for us to work um, for the last year with the Department of Shared Services and the Division of um, Workforce Services to um, build and support launch, uh, which we have uh, developed to help connect our Keynesians to in-demand careers, training to help them reach um, their upskilling goals and jobs that are open and available right now. 
Uh, I won't go into too much detail here. I'm going to hand it over to our product lead, Kate, who's going to run you all through a demo. Um, but we're really excited to get your thoughts, your feedback, and really appreciate the opportunity to work with all of you to help develop uh, a strong workforce for the future in Arkansas. Hey, everybody. Good morning. My name is Kate. Um, I'm the product lead here at Ripple. I've been working closely um, with many different people, um, some of whom are sitting in the room, uh, to work on launch and other products. Um, I'm happy to start with the demo unless anyone else on the Ripple team wants to say hello. I think we should go ahead and dive right in. Cool. All right. I'm going to attempt the ever difficult screen share. Great. Is everyone looking at launch? Okay, cool. So before I actually get into the tool, I did want to say a few words about what we're going to see and explain what it is we're going to look at in a minute. Um, so at its core, Launch for Job Seekers is really a job discovery application that job seekers can use to discover and train and transition to new careers. And behind the scenes, a couple of things are happening. We're using a Ripple developed algorithm to deliver personalized career recommendations in growing industries, to match workers, to best fit job opportunities in those industries, and also to direct workers to training programs. So the recommendations that users see in launch leverage Arkansas unemployment insurance data to uncover different successful career trans transitions that Arkansas Arkansans have made that resulted in best employment and earning outcomes in the real world. So on this homepage here, you'll notice um, a bit of talk about skills. And this echoes Arkansas's own really strong emphasis on skills um, acquisition and skills first hiring across the state. So now we will go ahead and pull back the curtain and see what's inside. I'm going to gloss over the onboarding part so we can focus on the meat of the matter and show what this process looks like for me, who for the moment is no longer going to be a product manager, but it's actually going to be a nursing assistant. So bear with me while I switch hats. While Kate's switching hats, all of this is it's an open source license, so it, it, it's code that comes from research approved code flies. It lives in the uh, Arkansas environment, so it, it's hosted, it's controlled, it's maintained, the security everything is reviewed by Arkansas. Okay, so in experience and skills, which is the page we're looking at right now, some of which is collected during onboarding, you can see that I did both an internship and previously worked at Baptist Health. So as I share more information about my experience and skills, Launch learns really how to tweak and improve the recommendations that it's delivering. So what's happening behind the scenes is that Ripple is leveraging a natural language processing tool that we developed called Socket, which assigns a SOC code to my job title and then is going to calculate which skills correlate most highly to the job so that when I go and add a new experience here, I have a leg up in thinking about how to express my abilities when I come to fill out this information. So I can continue to add new experiences of various types, share additional information about them. And as I share that information, skills are recommended. I add these to my profile. And as I add more information, Launch learns more about me and improves the recommendations. A feature that we worked on together with Arkansas Data was embedding elements of the Arkansas digital credential ecosystem into this tool. 
So I don't have this active in this environment, but I do have a couple of slides to show you what it looks like. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Yes. Nice. So there'll be another button here, which is share an experience from your wallet. And what happens when I click that is I get a QR code like you're seeing on the screen. A digital wallet will open on my phone and I'll give permission in the application on my phone to share the credentials from the Arkansas Digital Credential Ecosystem. And this information will automatically populate in this window right here. All this information taken together on this page will impact the recommendations that I'm going to see across careers, jobs, and trainings. I'm going to stop here to answer any questions about that. The main difference with those, they're going to show up differently. If someone self attests and says, I have this degree and I learned these skills, they can sort of select the skills. But if one of you know our institutions is verifying that it's locked down, the skills are what come from the curriculum designers and there's that <laughs> we're validating this person has these skills. Great. Thanks for adding that little bit of color there, Robert. Anything else anyone wants to add? OK. So in career paths, I can explore careers which use my skills as well as explore careers which maybe I haven't considered before. In jobs, I'm going to uncover <coughs> opportunities both in my current career and in new careers, which may be a good fit for me. And in training, I'm gonna see opportunities to build on my current skills. Another feature that I can avail myself of in launch, if I am experiencing a period of unemployment, is this one I'm gonna show you right now. is to track my work search activity requirements. So many of you are probably familiar with this requirement in this term, but starting Arkansas first, UI claimants had to start tracking five weekly work search activities, either applying for jobs, going to an interview, participating in a workforce event, or attending a job fair. So those efforts can be audited within up to six months, I believe, of their claim. So for that reason, tracking these events can save a lot of head headaches, streamlining the audit process really both for me, the claimant, as well as for UI auditors uh, to, yes, make that process a little easier and also ensuring that claimants can retain their benefits without any penalty. So this dashboard supports that effort. And here I can see my progress toward the week's five target activities in the pie chart. Track the work search activities performed by week below. This is how I add a new one. I select which activity I performed and then fill in the relevant details. And this information is automatically shared with the UI auditors who are having this increased workload and hopefully cuts down on some of the challenges of managing this process through snail mail and other means, which as we know is fraught with a lot of logistical challenges. So once I completed, um, once I completed entering my work search activity, I can download that for my records. In our other work with Chris Rhodes department, we're also revamping ArcNet, the continued claims tool, which is going to integrate seamlessly with launch and hand UI claimants off to launch to connect them both to an easy way to track their work search activity, um, as well as to find jobs and new career paths. So as we move forward with this tool and continue to build it out, we're really excited to look at the different ways that we can continue to incorporate the Arkansas Credential Registry and the Arkansas Digital Credential Ecosystem to help people connect to opportunities in the state. Thank you. I want to point on that part. We're, we're getting dual benefits there because we're, we're making it easier for the, the residents to, to understand the changing 
interaction requirements. It went for, uh, from three to five work search activities uh, on January 1st to easily track and make sure they're compliant and, and to do it more uh, seamlessly, but also for the Department of Corrections, we're, we're taking what is this current fairly manual intensive process. And because the data is there, um, getting operational efficiencies. And I think this is a pattern we can build on wherever we've got resident interaction. Does the portal has any interaction with third party tools like LinkedIn or anything like that? Is that something that is being planned to launch? Yeah, it's, we're designing for it, it, interoperability is our favorite word. Uh, so yeah, even, even that digital credential ecosystem is designed in a way that it, it's not just for launch. It's designed for interoperability of those things. Um, at the, the training is, is currently um, the eligible training provider list. Uh, we're in the process of adding all of the higher education programs to state supported higher education that, that are uh, recently published to the registry. And then we can continue to add whatever full learning or, or training uh, options from any source or maybe relevant and useful. Yeah, like, uh, probably they need to be specific. Have those plans of interoperability. Yeah. We can certainly look at that uh, because the previous platform that the state provided had that LinkedIn interface, and people didn't have to create double profiles. You know, there was a big scope. So I think that feature was really appreciated by some of the users that I had interacted with. So as long as we can register that program with the data for the skills that the algorithm can work, then uh, and we know that we'll, we'll probably be kind of, this is a little bit like the card catalog survey data, but it's been a, a way to, to, to drive people to um, a wide variety of learning management systems, but we'll, we'll kind of work to um, things like single sign-on and things like that to reduce user friction. Any more questions or Robert, anything else you'd like me to talk about in greater detail? No, I think you could probably just in the interest of time just talk a little bit about the, the next profile. That it, well, does anyone have any questions on launch for job seekers and actual job seeker profile? Um, from, from those cards are seeing Arkansas relevant information. They're personalized skills. Uh, they can indicate their preferences. So the more they the, the user chooses to or not to indicate preferences, that's only going to improve the recommendations. It's like Netflix. It's like the more you tell it, the better. It's going to cut it through the noise for you. Um, there are uh, videos on each career, and we're in the process of uh, filming Arkansas specific videos of Arkansas for the employers. If you know, all of them that we're as we're through the employers, those will start. Uh, being replaced with Arkansas specific videos, and there's links to uh, you know, replace with Arkansas specific labor market information on uh, employment, demand, earnings, and then buttons for going to uh, Arkansas jobs and related training. Right. Is that Edge, the Edge videos? The videos are to uh, Edge Factor, so that they're, they, they're, they have a film team. They've already filmed with, I think, 22 Arkansas employers. Is the scope of what they're doing limited to what we're seeing there in those examples? Is in well, what I'm thinking of is success stories. Um, anything that we think is valuable while they're kind of going and working with employers to film either career profiles, kind of profiles on the employer of the industry, or you know, they're developing a library of career exploration content. A lot of it is uh, very relevant to you know for fifth through twelfth grade, but also for adult learners for workforce development. There's actually the um, they have a library of content that's actually into for workforce developers or you know, for the roles of those who are serving. Um, All right, Kate, did you want to talk any about a uh, launch for employers? Sure. Um, 
Sure, yeah. Um, I think I'll pass that mostly over to my colleagues to speak about sort of the, the plan moving forward. I can say in short that we are um, in the final stages of pulling together the launch for employer side, which will also enable employers to connect to the job seekers who are using launch for job seekers. So that's going to be a really powerful tool, we hope, to help bridge um, this labor deficit that we've been hearing about for quite a while, and we hope we can make a small dent. Yeah, would Mintaka or Jada Abby like to chime in on some of the other plans we have in Arkansas? Yeah, Abby, do you want to take this question and talk a little bit about what we're um, hoping to do to make uh, this a seamless experience for users across uh, a number of different platforms? Absolutely. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Abby, the COO of Ripple, and I apologize for being off camera at the moment. My, my connection's a little unstable, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, we are uh, partnering with not only um, TSS and and uh, DWS, but also would love to partner um, with any agencies, um, you know, around the table today who are interested in talking to us a little bit more about how we can make launch, um, you know, even bigger and better for our cans and job seekers. Um, you know, in addition to uh, looking at what we have already live in the form of um, launch for job seekers, which Kate just wonderfully went through for us, and what will be uh, you know, becoming live um, in just a few months, launch for employers. Um, we are also looking to add additional components to Arkansas launch, um, things that will um, assist job seekers not only uh, find new careers and immediately open jobs and get connected to employers um, who have immediate demands. Um, but also, um, we're looking to expand launch to actually begin to connect job seekers to other government services um, that they could avail themselves of, you know, to help to, um, to help to kind of, uh, you know, stabilize their lives. Um, and, you know, to that end, um, we have been uh, chatting, obviously, with Robert and with some other with some other, um, you know, folks around the table uh, to talk about new ways that we can continue to add to um, to what we've already developed um, and ways that we're going to be able to integrate AR launch into um, other agencies and uh, other secretariats um, administrative uh, capacities to, to assist with other programs. It's not just obviously DWS um, that has administrative requirements around um, job seeking um, in the form of unemployment claimants, but also you know, folks in the HHS sphere um, have that need as well. Um, and so, you know, we are going to. We are committed to our partnership with the state of Arkansas, and um, while you know we've got these um, these sort of first versions, these first generation versions of these applications coming live, um, that does not mean that the Ripple partnership with Arkansas is is done. Um, we're committed, like I said, to the state. Um, to staying engaged and involved and continuing to work with um, with really any agency that uh, is interested in employing uh, modern technology to help improve the lives of its constituents. Um. Abby, this is uh, Charlie Collins. Could, hey, Charlie. could you share a little bit? Hey, How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm just wondering, could you share a little bit about what you're doing uh, currently in terms of populating the, the job sphere? In other words, are there some employers that have signed up or have you got some plans to talk some of the big employers? How are you going to do that initial population of the jobs for people to search? And I could absolutely. Start yep. That. Uh, so we are um, we're working with um, employers throughout the state, um, large scale employers, small employers, 
um, obviously mid-sized employers as well, to make sure that, and this is something that Kate and and um, Alec, who is basically uh, project managing this work, can talk to a little bit better than I can because they're actually in the weeds on it. But what we do is we do uh, extensive user research with employers. Um, we've even chatted with uh, folks in state government uh, who are looking to employ Arkansans who are recently graduated from high school or college. Um, and as part of that user research, what we do is we make sure that um, employers' needs um, are really being taken into account um, and that they're convenience is really paramount in terms of the actual build of the solution. Because what we want to make sure of is that it's a great user experience um, for the employer, something that is um, a little bit a little bit outside the norm for a government website, certainly for uh, a government website that you know asks employers to post jobs. Um, I myself have a background in state government and I can tell you that from working in a labor department, em employers aren't big fans of, uh, of a lot of the systems that states have up and running today. Um, so what we what we do is we, like I said, we do extensive user research, interviews, surveys. Um, we do we invite folks into soft launch. Um, this is something that we do in order to to get additional feedback once we have kind of a, a viable product up and running to make sure that when a public launch, when the actual uh, when the rest of the, the world gets invited in to use the solution, um, you know, it's it's the best solution that it can be. Um, so, you know, one of the things that we'll be doing is, of course, taking all of our cues from um, from DWS, from TSS, and from the governor's office as well in terms of inviting employers in um, to begin uh, searching for their candidates, um, you know, to really start looking at um, the pools of, of job seekers, uh, what they offer in terms of skills and background, um, professional experience and credentialing. Uh, to try to make those matches to invite those job seekers to employ for the open jobs. Thank you, Robert. Were you going to? I was just going to say, and this is, you know, when you're launching a marketplace, there's some chicken or the egg. It's like we want it to provide value to job seekers. We want it to provide value to employers, and you can't go from zero to everybody at once. Um, so we've been at, you know, we're focusing on bringing the job seekers on. First, because we're bringing in, it averages about 17,000 uh, job postings at any one time from the National Labor Exchange. It's the same pool of jobs that they would they would see in the current state program. So that way, we're not reducing availability to jobs, um, and that, that way we can be bringing residents on and hopefully providing value by giving them a, a more seamless way to discover and connect with those jobs. But that's still they click on it. It's the, the job seeker searching for the job, and then they are directed to the app and tracking system for that employer. The launch for employers piece turns it around the other way. It allows an employer to go in, build out a skills based job description, uh, and search the talent marketplace for those job seekers who have opted into discovery. They don't see name or identifying information, they don't see the graphics, all they see are skills so they kind of see a standard skills based resume skills credentials experience self-attested or verified and then skin the invitation so what we want to do is we you know, uh, as abby referenced there's been a lot of user research with uh some certain employers so they'll kind of come in because they they have an understanding of you know the populations that are on today and as it grows and what to expect and they'll really be testing to see if the features that they really kind of said, this is what we'd like to see if they're there, if they're working, we can test and adjust. We'll be looking at the, the job seeker population to start tiering in employers based on when we think there's uh, enough people in the right region, in the right industry, at the right education attainment level to be of value for certain You've got 17,000 jobs currently that there act as other ways that will be accessible to the end. Yes, so there'll be, there should be 
you know, there, there are jobs, there's immediate value for a job seeker, but then we, there need to be enough as we're ramping up the job seekers, that's when it starts you know, being enough value for the employers. So it's you know, that, that kind of bringing on employers in a strategic manner and just being transparent with employers about how we're you know, building up the, the marketplace. Right. Okay. Thank you. Maybe I missed this because I stepped out for a second. How are we getting this to job seekers? So I know we're populating it for employers and we've kind of got a tiered system for that. How are job seekers finding this? And this a, is, uh, oh, I sorry, please go ahead, Robert. I was just going to jump in and, and chat about some of the other work we've been doing with DWS, but please. As I say, we're, uh, we're kind of moving out concentric circles from those residents that the state has the most kind of what accountability to serve, starting with uh, it's already been uh, an option for uh, uh, what was called unemployment insurance is now reemployment services. <laughs> so uh, we've had uh, over 5,000 uh, users using that over the past several months from uh, Reemployment services that so we monitor and test and just there. Um, now is the time to start really looking at at other programs, particularly with the employment training component, or where it, it, residents might benefit from uh, support for connection with uh, learning and work opportunities. Um, Snap DMT comes to mind. Um, we, we just spoke to the, at the AR Home Advisory Panel earlier this week because of economic independence issue. Um, but, but we're really looking for uh, who, who do your departments serve that, that we should uh, be starting to get on to launch for job seekers, which is uh, ready today. Um, there, there is uh, you know, more public facing announcements are, are coming, but we're, we're kind of starting, you guys are working on getting our populations on. Um, and what supports do you need in terms of training, documentation, integrations of anything to, to make that as seamless as possible for your departments. And then are we integrating, I guess, with with college? Because I heard, you know, we're trying to attract college students, high school students. So, I mean, I would assume we're we're integrating with them in some way or we're, we're advertising there. I don't know how college students find out about jobs. I see some over there, so I'm pointing at them. Uh, uh, we, you know, we, we were ready for this, this past graduating class, but we certainly you know, want to make it available. If we have a resource and it's ready for residents, we want them to be able to do it now that the option. So I think like, this year as we're paying attention to the, you know, the, the graduating high school seniors, the CTE concentrators, the, the post-secondary completers, you know, anyone that's coming through programs, make sure that we are particularly with an employment training component. That we we can in a maybe as light way is just giving making sure they have the the, the URL the, how we where and how we can best get that into the process. All right, I got a question for going further. So it goes all back to data data harvesting, right? So where are we keeping all the data from? Just whenever you're doing those searches, I'm just curious how this. There is a research uh, so we can in the lake that's because it's separate from the administrative data. So the user data um, is there for the purpose of the, the algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's how it's doing recommendations for the users. But it's it's all within the, the state's control panel. So Robert, on the on the state level use cases, are you envisioning this to slowly replace AR careers? And AR careers oh, is supposed to coexist together. It's, uh, it, it coexists as AR careers is a full applicant tracking system. It has other HR information system functions. This isn't really intended to replace. But uh, all state jobs uh, are currently listed on here. And so I think like we'll just try to make it as seamless as possible. Just um, a, a suggestion right off the bat that I think is in the spirit of a couple of the initial questions that are coming up is a thing that's not on the list is a communications plan, as far as I can see. And to me, that would be uh, 
and true the true sense of customer focus right is a communications plan to the employers and to the public the workforce type folks that would be helpful i would think and that's currently in progress where we're really looking to make sure we've got full agency awareness and engagement and i mean how I don't have any details on that. I'm just saying that as a blanket statement, that's not on the bullet on the list. You know? Other questions, ideas, thoughts, suggestions for launch current or future or just the, the workforce strategy as a whole? So th this changes at least every 90 days. Uh, so we'll, you know, probably more briefly, like e each quarterly DTP kind of give updates, and, and but also without to, to wait. As we have substantive things, we can look, uh, reach out via email, and keep everyone informed. Uh, but you can uh, email me for um, starters, and I can connect you with the appropriate resources on our team. For, for how to get your, your populations onto this, or if you want to have any deep discussions, or if you want to kind of go into a deeper dive demo with your teams. Um, Ripple, do you have any, any other things you'd like to add? Just that we're excited to keep collaborating. Um, we'll certainly be collaborating with the state on a comms plan. I think that's a great uh, call out and something that we're working on. Um, and we really want to hear from all of you on how we can work to continue to improve this tool and make sure that it's the best it could possibly be for communities in Arkansas. So thanks everyone so much for your, your thoughts and your feedback. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today and uh, your support of our state. Thank you, Robert. Robert. Matthew, you want to go back to the, the main DTP slide? Sure. If more questions come up on that, we can go. We've got time for open discussion. Uh, but if not, we can go ahead and move on uh, 10 minutes early to the, the next agenda item, which is the AI and uh, Center of Excellence. Or, and you can thank Jay for this. If, since we're 10 minutes at, at a schedule, if ever was like a 10 minute break to stretch your legs. Fresh yourself, we can do that. And then we can pick back up at 1140 with the center of Thank you, James. Sure. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The, uh, the next topic on the agenda is establishment of the Arkansas AI and Excellent, uh, Analytics Center of Excellence, or AICOE. Uh, uh, Governor Sanders put out a press release uh, yesterday to uh, announce establishment. It, it will be a subcommittee of the Data Transparency Panel. Uh, the Data Transparency Panel over the past seven years has had subcommittees uh, you know, several times. When we've got something that, that we're not going to be able to handle the meeting once a quarter, two hours at a time. Um, when uh, the Arkansas data sharing agreement, which our shoot is uh, a big part of, was developed by a subcommittee DTP where we can get together, you know, meet more frequently with, with more roles involved. It's really more, you know, a, a research and working kind of group. But similarly, we use a subcommittee to, to think through uh, the recommendations for the, the statewide integrated data system. Um, this particular subcommittee will be established to uh, study, assess, and provide recommendations for policies, guidelines, and best practices for uh, ethical, effective, and safe use of 
AI across state government, which is very germane to the role of the data transparency, the, the interrelationships between uh, data analytics and artificial intelligence. Uh, the CIA CLE part of it, the um, press release will review and evaluate a set of pilot projects to encourage learning about AI and its potential risks. So we want to kind of, um, learn by doing uh, and to craft best practices for the safe implementation of the technology. Um, the CLE is set up to exist for one year from its date of establishment unless extended or terminated by government changes. Uh, the CLE will meet uh, monthly and provide an initial report to the governor by December 15th, 2024 on the, the progress um, with a, a focus on efficiencies, cost savings, safety, and economic development. Um, and we, we really, if, when we talk about AI, uh, we talked about this a little bit at the last two beginning, broadly even beyond specifically generative AI to and to make sure that we're level setting on the taxonomy and what we mean with AI and, and you know, whether it's more mature traditional machine learning, whether it's the, the generative AI we're looking at today, or um, in terms of like policies that last, like um, working in a way for the things that might be a year or two years out that we can't even really envision now, but kind of like looking at not the specific technological uh, implementation, but really looking at, at AI from the, the, the conceptual <coughs> what it does to um, sort of mimic, automate, you know, application of human intelligence. Uh, next. Uh, key considerations uh, from the press release would Something be. Something went wrong. Please try again. <laughs> Uh, accountability. So, you know, the AI is only as good as the data on which it's trained. I think that's something this panel appreciates more than most. And then there's the actual accuracy, the trust of, you know, A models themselves, um, appropriate data sets, uh, you know, using relevant and high quality data for training models. Also, there might be a bit of a taxonomy where, um, you know, from, from very, say, ubiquitous data, you know, for chatbots to some of the most sensitive administrative data, you know, we, we may want to work out taxonomies or guidelines for, um, you know, nuanced policies on, you know, with different risk and utility for different types of data sets. Um, uh, autonomy, kind of just, you know, acknowledging that that balance, the need for, in some cases, for human in the, the loop and how we can balance human error inside with AI automation. Um, bias, uh, certainly just acknowledging, understanding uh, the, the biases inherent in application of AI algorithms, how we can measure it, how we can mitigate it, um, uh, ethical standards in deployment usage of AI, uh, intellectual property ownership, um, Privacy and security. Um, we certainly have a lot more privacy officer, and chief information security officer, um, uh, and transparency, maintaining the openness about AI, its, its usage, uh, the processes, decision making, like what it's doing and how. Um, so, to support this group, uh, we're seeking nominations. We're asking each uh, EDP organization, these are the cabinet departments, the representatives from the House Senate Governor's Office, the Judicial Branch to uh, make uh, nominations for Governor Sanders' consideration to serve on the Artificial Intelligence of Excellence. I do want to emphasize members are not expected to be AI experts. We, I think, I think we, can, we'll, we can bring in expertise to serve this. We're looking for those who um, are thinking about the opportunities, the, the, the risks, you know, security governance considerations, really looking for uh, how we, we think we might leverage AI uh, to benefit residents, employers, communities, where we have hesitations or just questions about AI um, that are representing 
with our departments, our services that could serve uh, serve the state. Um, because and this is a process we took it several times before with different studies, just really just kind of laying out like what are the things that we want that we need to consider as a center of excellence, and then we can start bringing in any kind of external um, resources or expertise uh, to inform, advise, and, and support the center of excellence as, as we prepare our recommendations. Um, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'd like to just kind of open it up to open discussion at this point if we want to talk before making nominations. But questions, thoughts, concerns um, on the AI Center. So, Robert, the, the one thing I would just uh, offer is food for thought, and this is something that the AI group can, can look at. But on uh, your overview page, you talk about the focus on efficiencies and cost savings, which I totally get. But I think the other thing that we want to make sure we're exploring is the opportunity to improve the experience that citizens of Arkansas have with government uh, interactions, right? So if you look at, you know, let's say we've got 21 different services that we're providing, that we're looking at AI as an opportunity to increase the customer experience that our folks have, uh, in addition to the efficiency side. So that it's a kind of a dual mandate versus just a focus on efficiency. I wholeheartedly agree, and I think that it, that was actually uh, alluded to in, in the press release. Um, I didn't catch every nuance in the bullets, but uh, we have how we do our work as state government, how it can be more efficient and effective. There's improving the experience for those we serve, um, and then even broader. Uh, this is, um, there are going to be changes to skills with council, our internal people. Our, our um, overall state workforce, and so the um, cognizant of, of that with how we support our state's economy, how we support our state's employers, and, and how we need to evolve our services for them. Other thoughts? Do you want to uh, move on to nominations? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'd like to nominate, uh, I don't know if Jeff is in, he's right behind me, Jeff Dean from DHS. So Secretary Renee said to throw my name in the hat. So Jim Carter from Health. Um, so, Corey, who I'm representing, has asked me to nominate Maureen Smith, uh, Director of IT and Web Services at Data Scout. He's worked on a lot of AI projects for Fisher State Lens and uh, local and state government, and so he's also consulted on these exact topics. So, I think he'd be a good addition. Keep giving us for commerce, I'm nominated. And I heard from Secretary uh, McDowell this morning. Uh, uh, we had a discussion, but on the initial memo, we didn't see the bottom of the education's name uh, for the nomination, but it looks like we need a nomination from the Department of Education as well. So uh, it will be me. So. I'm hiding back here if you can't. Uh, you know, just general discussion. Uh, I'll nominate myself for it because it's, it's going to be there anyway. So, damn here. From energy and environment, just so everybody knows. Robert from the judiciary, I'd like to reserve the opportunity to nominate some people from our from our office and and push that back up to our chief justice as as well as um, the director of the AOC. Yeah. Um, send that to myself. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to do the same. I'll email you 
if that's okay. Well, this is a great pattern. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I need to talk to Secretary Hager and we'll get back to you. I think I have to pull the same because we didn't have internal talk about this yet, but I will definitely contact you. Brian Melton. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get back with him, sir? Oh, yeah. I was honored to be uh, mentioned on the list and confirm with Secretary Hudson that it's me. Gary, you're not getting out of here. Heather. Thank you. The Attorney General has on me and I gladly accept it. Uh, Secretary Wallace is on vacation this week. She wants to discuss it with me uh, based on what I heard today. And so I'll get back with you next week. Okay. Oh, we're on the table. So the Represented. Um, yeah. If you have uh, reserved, just email me and um, so we will be working this time. Um, how about next Friday? Okay. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Um, so by next Friday, we'll Do we have any anything else to discuss? Any questions on the AI center license before we kind of move on to more for open discussion? And this could be quick and then like as we bring the membership together that first meeting we learning the structure and really what we want to look at. Particularly for DTP members uh, who will not be serving on the center of excellence. Are there any topics that you can know, pre-identify to be considered, discussed, evaluated? I mean, when we're talking about fraud and we're talking about cost savings, it seems that Medicaid and SNAP would be applicable. So, and I know Jeff knows this. So, I mean, it'd be something to explore. I don't know how AI fits in that sphere, but it seems like it could. Uh, and, and there's a lot of opportunity in that area. I think about engagement of the target and state and public engagement on things like UI benefits. Some of the use cases that we've looked at uh, is you know, the contact center, so the AI assistance in that, which would be the citizen facing type stuff. So um, document AI is a, a very good topic. It looks like it can save time where if you're trying to do OCR, it takes hours and hours and costs money for every single form or using document AI. You could just ingest a certain amount and it automatically, you know, helps with that. So uh, other use cases that we're looking at is uh, assistive technology like on newborns to help speed that process up and make sure it's it's going that's a very narrow use case that we're looking at uh, that's been approved for our eligibility system um, and then lastly uh, policy assistance stuff so um, where you can ingest your policies and the caseworkers can query how long does someone have to do this or they can query so and the best use cases I've seen for that not only pops up an answer, but it also gives you the reason behind the answer and you can open up the source documents that helps with the validation and, and bias. So those are some of the strongest use cases we've seen. That's very helpful. I look forward to <laughs> digging deeper into those. As far as the Department of Health, one of the biggest things is the outbreak response. So I can see AI actually monitoring that, watching where outbreaks are, where the occurrences are. So I, I would I would advocate for that. If I can add from the peanut gallery back here. Uh, for corrections, there's a number of specialized use cases, but 
I think on a more global scale, um, applying some of this to recidivism data and yes. looking at inputs and outcomes and, and all the various threads that uh, can lead to recidivism. Thank you, Adam. That's definitely identified as an area of interest given recidivism task force and sure. uh, protect that. <laughs> Others? We can come back to this uh, in the open discussion or uh, if you sleep on it and that's a good promise. Um, we'll get these um, by next Friday, the nominations to Governor Sanders to review and approve, um, and then we'll you know, be in touch with the, the logistics information to work out the uh, scheduling and meeting of the center of excellence. Um, so, Matthew, if you want to advance the slide, please. Um, so, I want to make sure we have time for um, open discussion and future agenda The OBTG could be for almost seven years, and almost everything we've done has been brought up in this group by someone saying, hey, we're starting to see a need here. For, you know, and, and we just kind of like talked about it and kind of worked through it as, as a group. Uh, so, and for the, the future agenda, if, if there's something interesting, Jeff just mentioned a whole lot of interesting things. It's like if, if there is something uh, going on at your agency that you, you know, bring to the group as community of practice that we can all learn from and apply uh, for a topic that you think would be Jermaine for this group to, to have a focused discussion on. Like we want to make sure that this this entire panel is, is helping to like drive that discussion for the benefit of our states. So we'll just kind of open up the floor to an open discussion and you know future agenda setting as we move going forward. So Robert, one thing that I would just toss out, I don't know if it's relevant or not, but one of the things that we've just initiated a contract on is creating a mobile identification credential, often called a mobile driver's license, but before the uh, ASP gets nervous, it doesn't necessarily qualify if you get pulled over yet. But what it could qualify for is as a credential, which can give universal access to government systems. So we're on the very, very front edges of creating this. The RFP has been awarded, but if, if there's something that we need to do or be aware of to make sure that it can meet the needs of, of all the different uh, government entities uh, as one way of being an access credential. I, you know, let me know and we can find a way to make sure that we share what's necessary. I think identity management is probably something that everybody here thinks back here is back to benefit from. That's touching with the largest number of Kansas <laughs> at 1.8 million or something. So I think that would definitely be something. So there's two things on it, right? Number one is I, I'm always nervous about getting so far down the field and then somebody says, hey, here's an idea that would really help us in commerce or whatever, but we've already made those decisions six months ago. So, so and I'm not a technology guy, so I don't know what all the little tabs and buttons are yet. So uh, I don't know, maybe we talk offline and I have you kind of talk to my experts in that area and then you can kind of decide when the right time. That sounds great. Oh, okay. One thing I can say, uh, just uh, MDL is the, the gold standard for the purpose of a driver's license, but we can get the credentials of over hard to find out about uh, the World Wide Web Consortium Digital Standard, which I think that would be fairly easy to translate. Just down the phone. I'd like maybe like to have a discussion about standards, policies, guidelines for data warehousing, lakes, rivers, whatever, glass of water. That, you know, what are we doing as a state? You know, EHS versus ADH versus any of the other things. So that we're all kind of on the same page, so at least have a guideline or a, a direction. That, that is, what do you mean, what, what are we doing with them? The data. Oh, with the data, okay. 
that that's the accord of the DDP, the DDP's original charge was go forth and build a statewide data warehouse, which through you know, 18 plus months of these types of discussions, groups and things like that, we said, you know, this is, this is at that point, 2019, there's other ways to do this mm -hmm. than to make a, a, a repository some copy. Um, and even better than that, but it's a perfect time. It's a critical to the, the charge of DDP. It's still in our enabling legislation and statute to like come back and have a discussion on kind of like where we have on that in 2024. Because I can say the Department of Health has lots of data, but they're all in silos and they're in groups and they aren't put together. Right. So when we're having that discussion, I mean, I feel like it'd be more helpful to target specific topics of data right because i mean you know if we just talk about data in general we're gonna we're gonna be grabbing a lot so i mean from my perspective and, and again way in I, I don't know what i'm talking about often uh it seems like it would make sense if we targeted certain things that we could attack right especially when we're talking about efficiencies and savings and, and some of our goals in that regard for state government so for me uh, you know, it seems like it would make sense for maybe a contracts focus or um, just in general across state government so we get an idea of like what our contracts look like, what, are the, what they look across the board. I think this dovetails with some of the other work that's going on across the state, you know, with the McKinsey Project and some of the other things. Uh, so it, I feel like there's an opportunity for us to work in conjunction with that and try to get because again, I think the goal is more targeted data, right? Data that we can take action on. So we've got a lot of data, right? You can do nothing or a lot with the data, uh, but I feel like since we've got it, now is the time to start narrowing our focus so that we can make decisions on that and actually get to some of these efficiencies and savings that we're talking about, right? Um, so, I, and you know, contracts is just one that comes to mind because I think that's an area where we can have a lot of savings, but I'm I'm open to, to really any topic that anybody would want to toss out if we go down that route. I think I would just add for thought, uh, you know, Jim, you kind of got me on this path a little bit, so. <clears throat> You know, from my perspective, when you when you think about data in general, right, um, you, you have to be able to classify the data first, right? So in order to put a treatment application, if you will, to a data set, you have to understand the data classification of that set of data. <clears throat> and so when you build a data classification, classification process, you will then know priority of data, urgency of data, sensitivity of data, uh, and you can begin to apply certain, uh, you know, standards like encryption, data at rest, data movement. Um, all these things factor into a, a data classification process, so it probably would help us to think about at some point a data classification process. That's where I get back to the data governance. That's what that's what's going to drive that. Same. Right. It's Same also thing. going to give you security yeah. risk assessments and your you know vulnerabilities and things like that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, but the the other component to it is is being able to access it for analytics, for dashboards. Right. Through the analytics to be able to make, you know, get insights and then from the insights, be able to get conclusions and recommendations. Yeah, and that's a good point too. visualizations. You know, we may be using Tableau, we've got Power BI, we've got SAS, we've got all these different tools out there. You know, are we collaborating on that? Are we focused on Power BI since it's in your office 365? These are the kind of things I think we need to focus on that we get back to the contracts. I have a contract with Office 365. Obviously, I have the Power BI, but do you have a Tableau contract, right? And of course, it's very expensive, so I hope somebody got a good deal on it. <laughs> okay. 
Mm -hmm. That might give us a good starting point. We're starting to, to kind of go more in detail. Through. It started out to develop the data warehouse through the um, the, the required study from Act 912 So the DTD shall conduct uh, a cost feasibility study on approaches for state data warehousing to kind of um, do uh, lots of research and advice. And we have visitors from Indiana and other states and expertise, we can pivot into a data hub approach that, that a subcommittee kind of developed and uh, a couple of agencies have, have been early adopters on um, the data hub, but now I think we're, we're ready to really start scaling out the, the, the first sort of steps in that toolkit. There's a, a, a much more robust data catalog. You know, we, we previously had the Arkansas Data Asset Inventory, but it really works at a data set level. Um, this data catalog is, is uh, very comprehensive to, to support managing uh, the business metadata, doing profiling. Uh, big, big circle started seeing it the, the other day. Um, doing kind of active metadata, so it's constantly keeping up with that, supporting data quality management, but also the, the tagging of data with the, the business terms. Uh, they, you know, they start tagging out. As we link in our assets, this is this is an email address, so we can set up rules that um, masked as that you know, for different roles. Um, or, 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 and it actually tries to um, use AI to, to look for things uh, for management by exception. Yeah, you, you said this is a, an email address. It has the policies of an email address, but there's a pattern in here that makes it. Uh, a certain entry would like an SSN, <laughs> you know, those types of things. Uh, so we can kind of surface interesting things. I think that's, that's a the key kind of foundation to start to do you know, privacy preserved role based sharing like, with, with full you know, governance control, but also like then to start saying that um, either visualizations or you know, the kind of technology independent where Tableau can use it, Power BI can use it, whatever. But, you know, if someone's doing SPSS or SAS, or, you know, R or Python, their their tool of choice. Um, but where we can start, I think it's the first step to sort of like, um, bridging, you know, mitigating those silos and, and getting uh, a stronger governance foundation. So that might be something that we kind of discuss next time is the the knowledge catalog and data governance piece. One thing I might add too, when we think about, so, you know, one of the things that we've kind of recognized across the state is, you know, we, we could, we could probably improve our third party assessment process on third party vendors, and third party software. Um, <clears throat> you know, now, you know, everybody's coming at us with, you know, their AI enabled tool. You know, let, let us introduce our AI into your environment. Um, and I'm, I'm probably getting 15 to 20 emails a week about, you know, vendors, you know, wanting to speak with us about their AI model. And so I think as a, as a governing body, we, we need to we need to think about building governance that allows us to um, use AI the way the state wants to use AI, not the way a vendor wants us to use AI. And um, <clears throat> sometimes it's easy to fall into the trap of, you know, hearing the marketing hype, if you will, um, and it sounds really good. Uh, but if you go a little bit deeper, sometimes you'll find <coughs> areas of concern. Um, and I'm not here to say what those might be right now. All I'm bringing up is I think we need to develop an awareness about using third party AI enabled tools and do those tools meet our strategy for how we want to use AI within the study. Gary, it sounds to me like the, the excellent point you're bringing up really kind of builds, Mitch, on what you were saying earlier, that the starting point for that is understand what are our current data and systems contracts, what vendors do we currently have, and maybe even before we get to this AI world, 
and, and they have a good understanding of that. And then you get to your point where the synergy opportunities, if I'm paying 10 cents a use for Tableau and you're paying a buck and you want it, why don't we get one Tableau contract, right? Or maybe we're already doing that. And then this, you've already got some AI. I don't have any. You're worried about his. You've got a better idea. He can replace his and I can get mine, right? So your idea of getting the contracts, just getting an understanding of what we got could be very helpful. Well, and even to Charlie's point, to narrow down just contracts as an overall topic, like a subtopic under contracts, to Charlie's point, is like maybe we want to focus on IT contracts, right? And see what we have out there uh, or, uh, you know, really pick your topic. There are, there are a bunch under there uh, uh, to start analyzing, you know, where do we have duplicity across the state with contracts and vendors? And where, to Charlie's point, can we work better as a state to both, you know, we could negotiate better contracts or we bring other state entities onto our already existing contracts to kind of reduce, reduce what we spend, create savings, create efficiency, create collaboration across state government. So, um, you know, I said contracts as a whole, but we may want to target something within that round right and make it worth our while so not every kind not the five dollar contract but pick a number <laughs> 20 million yeah i mean because a lot of my time literally i mean i've got two thousand folks and we talk about you know the day-to-day -day stuff and there's a lot of tracking and the number of times i sign my name you know on these things right compared to some of these you know the hundred million dollar stuff now, when you pull all those up and they're all DHS contracts, I want you to dig a little bit deeper so other people can be in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I think I do. <laughs> we get into the millions too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think in, when you think about governance in this in this context, it the the tricky part of this is when you're talking about in what I'll call enterprise level agreements. Um, so you, you have to balance local agency need with enterprise level approach, right? So it's 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 tricky, right? Because you know I know I know Jim and ADH have got very specific needs that they need to meet. I know Jeff is the same. Um, you know DWS is the same way. So when you start thinking about condensing and centralizing, you know I think. We have to really come together very tightly to understand, you know, agency level need and couple that with an efficient enterprise level approach. And there, there's no, there's no real formula to doing that. You know, there's no textbook or standard that you can go to that tells you how to do it. it it's this group, I think, that the better we collaborate, uh, the you know, we're going to be able, you know, I think, Mitch to have some success uh, with enterprise agreements because while we're getting more efficient and effective, we can also reduce complexity uh, as well. And uh, and I know there's we have plenty of complexity. Yeah. <laughs> I see, you know, I, we see it every day, but um, balancing those two. Um, I think I you're think, right on point. I think the, mm -hmm. what we've got to do is get that data, narrow it down, so that we have some subsets to work with because what you're going to see is you know we've got 150 janitorial contracts across the state right and i made that number up so don't quote me on that but uh but you know that's not the contract that we want to consolidate right those are a lot of local vendors they're more predicated on who's in that county and who can do that work we don't have big janitorial contracts throughout the state we've got a lot of smaller pieces right and so when someone's coming in without good specific data, they're going to look at that and say, we should combine all of our janitorial contracts and we're going to save money. And that's not where we save money, right? Where we save money and where we create efficiencies and where we get these enterprise agreements are going to be more on like our IT contracts, which can be used across multiple departments that share a common purpose. And we can actually do these enterprise level agreements. So I think to your point, Gary, and it is very valid, which is we've got to be able to get that data to an actionable level, 
right? To narrow it down and narrow it down and narrow it down, and then give that to the departments and our secretaries so that they can make decisions and collaborate with each other so we can really drive that forward. Uh, I, also, I don't want to lose sight of our citizens. Right now, you know, if I were an outsider outside of state government, where do I go to get this? Where do I go for my driver's license? Where do I go for my fishing license? Where do I go for my plumber's license? And it's all cross agencies, right? But that that citizen, think about going to a page and everything that they have is right there. And I want to renew this, I want to renew this, I want to renew this, or hey, where do I get this? Or what's the closest local health unit? That's what I want to focus on. That's efficiency. We could talk about all the back end and all the contracts and all the IT stuff, but really I think this focus of this panel is to look at that person and what are they what are they looking for? What do they need? So let me let's play a little catch ball. So okay. so we're talking about an animal that I'm told is properly called a government services portal. Right? And Robert, you jump in here if I don't articulate this right. And the concept would be Rather than spending $25 billion to take 1,200 disparate computer systems, which is what I understand we have in Arkansas, and re breaking them all down with a hammer and reworking them so they can talk to each other. Rather than doing that, you go over the top the way Netflix went over the top of the cable companies through a magic Star Trek language translator called the Data Hub. And Robert says he thinks he's got one of them. And, and then that data hub takes your Department of Health data, which is in Klingon language, and my driver's data, which is in uh, you know uh, Vulcan language, and it makes it so that on that page you can see those different things. But it doesn't own those things, and it doesn't reside there, and it's got little codes on it, but it goes back to its original place. So the IRS for me and whoever for you doesn't want to beat you up for, for doing that. But as the citizen, you can get at it. Now, nobody's ever done this, as I understand it, because the technology's never existed, and the way it's always been tried is breaking down all those old systems. But Robert thinks that maybe we've got the technology in this hub, or maybe we can kind of bring that to life. And so one of the things that we need to make sure as we're moving forward on that is giving everybody that wants to be a part of the ground floor a chance to be on the ground floor. This is very similar to what we do with SHARE. Okay, all, it, it doesn't own the data but it's got all of the health records from the, the VA. It's got the health records from Baptist and it goes out and finds Jim Carter and says, here's all, here's what the doctor can see, right? So I know the technology's there. I think we just need to figure out how do we wrap it together. And shout out to Charlie for recognizing his audience and that we'd all understand a Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> To his point, and I think it's a good one. I think this panel has multiple focuses, right? And so, you know, we don't need to forget about the citizens and the efficiencies that we create so that they can communicate with us and we can communicate with them better and they get access to all of our services better. I think we have also our focus of efficiencies and savings and using the data that we have to try to drive that. And then we also have our cybersecurity portion that we have so I, you know to me that's what this panel is is those three focuses right and i think you know we need to make sure that we're driving all three of those things in, in these meetings so, and i would put the cybersecurity as the foundation of the house right because when that breaks we lose the trust of our kansans and the rest of this is you just a bunch of bureaucrats so that's that's the foundation well, to Jim's point, you know, we have to, you know, maybe introduce some terms like, you know, data stewardship, data custodian, data owner. Uh, these these two have classifications and categories. And when when you are entrusted with a third party's information, you you become the custodian of that data. And so uh, you have to treat that data, Jim, as capital. Right. I mean, it, it, you have to look at it the same way because um, I know some of you have seen some of these worst case uh, situations where people's identities have been uh, compromised. I mean, you, you, you can ruin people's lives um, by mishandling their data. And, um, you know, I think Mitch brings up a good point. That data 
a lot of that data lives within the state ecosystem in, in one, one platform or another. Um, and when you talk about bringing all that data together, right, you're, you're bringing a level of, of, of complexity in there that we have to think about, right? And, and uh, there's a number of tools that we can use to protect us. I mean, uh, enterprise level identity tools and identity management tools um, are, are key to what we're talking about here today. Uh, there are user behavior analytical tools that can be used that can uh, isolate unusual type requests, unusual type data requests uh, that, you know, will alert and flag us to something that's not normal for us. So all these things, all this cyber ecosystem that you're talking about, it, it we just need to think about it as we go forward. I just would make one more point, you know, the words data sharing sounds like it's just this generic term, but there's a dramatic difference between the citizens saying, I volunteer to share something versus bureaucrats sharing something. It, it's, it's a wildly different, right? So if a citizen says, I volunteer to let you use my face or my fingerprint or whatever, something goes wrong, but they volunteered for it, they can have a little bit of countenance for that. But, but if it's bureaucrat sharing things and it's not explicitly approved by the citizen, something happens, dramatically different world for us. So we just need to be really, really sensitive to that. Yeah, and I, you know, that's the world I came out of in my previous job, you know, uh, uh, an opt-in, opt-out status. You know, we've got the GDPR rules. We've got, you know, the European rules that are trying to come in over ethical use of data. Uh, do we give citizens an opportunity to opt-in or opt-out? Right? Or do we just assume we're going to use their data however we choose to use it? Not good. Not good right? Because you will develop um, just r really a misuse, right? And and to some level in the private sector, when you when you don't take those things into consideration, you, you're considered negligent, right? Because you're using people's data um, either unknowingly or at your, you know, at your discretion versus, you know, at the individual discretion. So there, there are a lot of rules that come to play here, you know, and the things that we're talking about, um, and they're all solvable, right? We just have to be aware of them and, and, and be mindful as we go forward about the decisions that we're making on how data will be used. And you're talking my language with health data. I mean, that's exactly spot on. Yeah. Whether or not I want to allow my health data or what piece of health data do I want to let known. And are we so violating any of the HIPAA that? regulations as we go forward? Are we aware of HIPAA? HIPAA is maniacally uh, intensive, right? Uh, to maintain a, a HIPAA certification is really hard to do uh, because uh, you are audited uh, very deeply. Um, and it it it, uh, it can take a year to achieve a HIPAA certification. No, we're also just talking about state entities too. We also have federal requirements yeah. that that mandate what we can and can't right. do. Good conversation. Yes, uh, I want to. I hesitate to stop it, but we are at time and we respect everyone's time. One final thing that Mike kind of curious changed recently. The um, Office Management Budget changed, uh, made some changes to uniform guidance for cost accounting principles, and I'm not super excited when I was to talk about federal cost accounting principles, but uh, it is that these changes are specific to facilitating more sharing of infrastructure, particularly as it relates to data, AI, and cyber security. So we may have some new options, and that might be a catalyst to evaluate. <coughs> where we might leverage that for savings. And that, Matthew, if you go to the next, uh, our uh, next meeting, we uh, to do like the third Thursday, the third month is uh, scheduled for September 19th, 10.30 to 12.30. Uh, we're going to use this room again? Maybe. <laughs> 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 if, if it was, yeah.
So the number two, uh, we'll send out the location of South Sea and uh, and I think we've got plenty of closing thoughts and we respect our own time. So this meeting is adjourned, but it's free to stay and discuss that. Thank you. You're going to bring us lunch during this time? Is this well the better?